chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. We'll go through all this, so I don't, I'm not going to stand, uh, have you stand up and read it to you. We're just going to go through this. It's a, just another study. We're going through this, uh, this book. I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to look at it a little bit deeper because a lot of times when I'm just reading through it, my regular reading, things aren't necessarily making sense. Uh, some of it has helped since we went through the Kings and Chronicles uh, a while back. Some of it has... Uh, um, you know, kind of made a little bit more sense uh, in my head anyway. And so I don't know if you can remember that. It was a hard study, long study with all the, you know, northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. But, uh, but now reading through Isaiah, some of those things are jumping out at me as, as he talks about different things. And so uh, look right away at uh, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, uh, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Razan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Okay, so we'll give a little bit of context. I love how Isaiah has done that so far. Uh, very beginning, it talks about what all the different kings that um, Isaiah was alive for. He ministered during the times of all these different kings. And Uzziah dies in chapter 6, we see, in the year that Uzziah died. And, and this is what Isaiah saw, and then he accepted the call to go preach. I talked about that last week. And so now, this next uh, prophecy is coming in the days of Ahaz, who's the son of Jotham, who's the son of Uzziah. So now a couple generations have gone by. Isaiah is still, uh, uh, I shouldn't say generations, Jotham, a couple reigns. Okay, so Jotham, I don't remember how long he was a king, uh, but he was a king. And, and all of these are on the southern kingdom. So notice it says king of Judah. Remember the kingdom is divided because of the sins of Saul and, and uh, the rebellion uh, that, that, that happened there and with his son and and uh, so it was divided in northern kingdom. And then the smallest little section of it was the southern kingdom, which is Jer where Jerusalem is. And where the kings were going to come. This is all out of uh, the line of Judah, right? And so this is where the, the line of Christ was going to come through. Uh, all the kings in the southern kingdom. Okay, so you remember God preserved that. There are sometimes... Uh, where it was sought to be destroyed. Whereas in the northern kingdom, you had kings overthrowing other kings, and there's all these different bloodlines and stuff like that. Uh, but the southern king kingdom is kept this, this line of Judah. And, and it's because the promised Messiah was going to come out of this line. And so it's being kept uh, preserved. One way to look at it, in our human minds, uh, it's, it's hard to understand, you know, how, how God sees things in his, in his foreknowledge and all that. But from our perspective, God just kept it pure and he preserved it and he, he stopped things from happening that would have destroyed uh, the kingdom and all that. But it's all about Christ. If you remember, we went through Kings and Chronicles. I was like, man, it's all about God, you know, preserving that line in the southern kingdom. But the northern kingdom, you know, all the kings in the northern kingdom were bad. Southern kingdom had some good ones, some bad ones, but the northern kingdom was all bad. And they became kind of enemies with the southern kingdom. Even this is, though this is all the sons of Israel, like, you know, this is the families of this, the line of Israel, the 12 tribes. But now you've got those 12 tribes divided into two. And, and most of the time they're feuding. Now there's a time where Je Jehoshaphat in the, in the days of Ahab, uh, Jehoshaphat tries to unite them. And, 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 you know, he's making an allegiance with them and all that. And, and God sends a, a man of God to rebuke him for that. And says, why are you loving that which God hates? Kind of an idea. Why are you being a friend of the, those who God hates? And so here in this, it, it, we're talking about, you know, Isaiah here is, is, is prophesying in the southern kingdom. He's making a lot of prophecies about, about the northern kingdom, Israel. But... Judea, the southern kingdom, is who he's primarily um, dealing with. So Ahaz, 
uh, and of course Uzziah, Jotham, and, and, and going all the way back. These are all the southern kingdoms. But then notice it says, uh, it says king of Judah, which is, you know, the southern kingdom. But then it says that they went up, that, the, that Israel, the king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it. And so your first thought when you read that might be, you know, well, I thought this was the southern kingdom. How could the northern kingdom go up to the southern kingdom? Well, that's our understanding of looking at a map and thinking up, down. But when they talk about it in the Bible, a lot of times they're talking about the elevation. And so going up to, we talked about this a little bit this morning when we talk about the Mount of Olives, right? Uh, Jerusalem, the city of David is kind of up on a hill and the Mount of Olives is up on a hill. And so they're going up to where uh, uh, Jerusalem is. And so the northern kingdom is attacking the southern kingdom, but it says here at the end of the verse, they went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, you say, okay, well, that makes sense because the northern kingdom was wicked. Southern kingdom were God's people, and Christ was going to come out of God's people and all that. So God's protecting the southern kingdom. The only problem with that is, Ahaz was not a good guy. Remember I said some of the southern kingdom kings were good and some of them were bad? Well, Ahaz was a bad one. Okay, just for a quick reference, look at 2 Kings chapter 23. Oh, wrong way. 2 Kings 23, look at verse 12. And the altars that were on the top, and this is after Ahaz's time, but it references Ahaz, uh, of the upper chamber of Ahaz, so we're talking about altars on the top of the upper cha chamber of Ahaz, which the king of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the, uh, cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. So, uh, so when this good king comes on the scene, he's taking down everything that Manasseh did and everything that Ahaz did. Because Ahaz was one of those guys, and we're not just going to look at a bunch of scriptures that talks about it, but one of those guys that was a bad king. It says like, um, you know, he was evil and did not the ways of, of David, his father, something like that. Okay, and so this was how you knew when one of those kings was, was bad. So in Isaiah's day, it, 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 he's prophesying and in, in in, in speaking for the Lord to Ahaz, who's a bad king. But the northern kingdom, which has, I guess you could say, even a worse king, they're both bad, tries to prevail against Judah, and they can't. Okay, God won't, let them, God won't let them. And the reason why I think primarily is simply the thing that we keep going back to, that it all has to do with the line of Christ. God is not saving the people because of, a, of, of Ahaz. He's not even saving the people because of Isaiah, although Isaiah is a good man. He's saving the people because of Jesus. And so he's keeping that line pure. But don't you know, misunderstand Part of the judgments that we see in the book of Isaiah is Isaiah saying, hey, Judah, you're going to get yours too for disobeying God. And we know that ultimately they end up in Babylonian captivity and the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem is basically destroyed and taken over. And so, uh, so, you know, it's not like they're going to get away without any judgment. It's just at this time, God's preserving um, the southern kingdom as well. <clears throat> so... God wouldn't let them prevail. As you, as you read on here, uh, let's look at verse 2. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart had, was uh, moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Okay, his heart's moving. It's not in the alliance uh, like it used to be. Uh, then said the, the Lord unto Israel... I mean, sorry, to Isaiah, go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shira Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, you remember we talked about Kidron Valley. Like this morning I was laying out how we have uh, the city of David and then over to the east is the... Um, is the Mount of Olives. Right in the middle of that is the valley of the, the Kidron Valley. 
And uh, in the Kidron Valley, there was a spring, the Gihon Spring, which is the source of water which made that whole area so important. Because, you know, otherwise it's in a pretty desert region. I mean, um, I, I suppose at one time it was a lot more fertile, but uh, for the most part, it's pretty much a, it's, it's a dry climate. And in the temple, they needed access to water. I mean, think about, if nothing else, just washing the blood from all the sacrifices and, and different things. And so, so that water source was very important, and there's this spring that goes up. So throughout the Bible, you'll see different uh, mentions of, of uh, in this point, at this point it says a conduit, or uh, I can't remember the other word. Uh, there's another word that's used, I can't remember, but... Uh, basically just different avenues that will like direct that water to the different places. And then eventually, I learned some of this in that, remember I told you that video that's coming out here pretty soon that I made some drawings for? Some of this is just stuck in my head from this, but uh, um, in Hezekiah's time, they actually dig, dug a tunnel underground, and that still exists today. You can go in there and you can walk through it and see the water from the spring there. And, uh, and it carries that water into the temple. And so, uh, so Isaiah is told to go and to meet Ahab, he and his son, to meet them at the end of the conduit in the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint hearted, for the two tails uh, of the smoking fire brands, not exactly what this is talking about. I, I, should have looked that up more. Uh, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up unto Ju Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Uh, Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Razan, uh, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim of, of, is with Eph, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. That's the capital of the northern kingdom. And the head of Samaria is Ramaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Okay, so. Isaiah now is calling out, he's meeting with Ahaz, and he's saying, okay, the northern kingdom is coming, and they're going to attack, but God's not going to let it happen. Uh, but he's ultimately saying, hey, you need to believe the Lord, and you need to do right. And, the, and you can go back into uh, uh, 2 Kings, and you can see that Isaiah is, is trying to prophesy against the wickedness going on. And he's saying, uh, you need to do right, uh, otherwise you're going to be destroyed. destroyed. So... <laughs> The next uh, little section here starts in verse 10. It says, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying. So now this is Isaiah talking, but he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord is the idea. Okay, And here's what he says. Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Okay. Sounds like a good guy, right? I'm not going to tempt the Lord. You know, the Bible says not to tempt God, even though God's the one saying, hey, ask me for a sign. Uh, but I'm going to explain to you here in, in a minute. I'm trying to, you know, put this together and say, you know, why is he asking him to tell him a sign? Like, why would the prophet go up to him and say, hey, ask for a sign? I mean, isn't that weird? Like, just, hey, ask for a sign. Um, all right, Lord, will you... Uh, just cause a spring to just come up out of the water right now. Like, you know, <laughs> would you allow the moon to just uh, stop shining all of a sudden, just like a blood moon, and it just, you know, what a weird thing to just off the spot, hey, give me a sign. And so I want to ask the question, like, why, um, why ask a sign? Like, what is, what is the purpose of this kind of a, this request? Kind of seems like a weird request. Um, Remember that Jesus, what Jesus said about a, a, a signs. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, 4. A wicked and adulterous generation 
seeketh after a sign. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, Paul says, you know, Jew, the Jews seek, seek a sign. And, and the Greeks, uh, you know, they seek wisdom. And so, you know, it's kind of something that seemed to be normal among the Jews is that they want to see a sign. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees here, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh the, uh, after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And, of course, we know that he says, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of I mean, in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. He's, 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 that's not in here. This isn't another gospel account. Uh, but uh, that's the sign that he's telling him. And ultimately what Jesus is saying is, hey, here's your, here's your sign. One of these days the Son of Man is going to be crucified. He's going to be buried. And then three days later he's going to rise up from the dead. And of course... You know, some of those guys might never have remembered Jesus making that sign, giving them that sign or, um, or whatever, but we have it in the Bible. So we read that and say, like, okay, this is what he's talking about. This is the gospel. This is the sign. This is the only sign that you need. Don't ask Jesus for a sign like he gave you a sign. He sent his son and he died on the cross. And, and, and so Jesus, that's Jesus' claim. Like there, there's no, son, no sign that I'm going to give you except for I'm going to be three days. And, and, and he's just making a point to them that, that you need to know who I am. And so you might look at this and say, that's a weird request. Just going up to Ahaz, Ahaz the king and saying, hey, make a, make a request a sign. But then again, prophets ask some weird things. And he's, he's speaking for God. He's doing what God told him to do. So it's not like he's just a weirdo that's making stuff up. But the prophets looked like weirdos a lot of times in the Bible because God would ask them to do some weird things. Go to 1 Kings chapter 20. I'll give you an example. 1 Kings chapter 20. You might remember this story here. First Kings 20. Do you think it's weird for a prophet to just go up to a man and say, hey, ask God for a sign? Well, how about this? What if a prophet walked up to you and said, slap me in the face? <laughs> That's a weird thing to ask somebody to do, right? But look at verse 35. Uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. I would imagine most people would. If I just walked up and said, hey, hit me in the face really hard. I mean, I, you might find one that would be like, great, you know, that's a new sport. Did you guys know that there's actually a sport? Uh, is it just called slap? What's it called? Like power slap. It's like UFC. Like uh, it's it's weird. These guys stand up there and they have rounds and they have all these rules and stuff and they just like smack someone in the face to see if they knock out. Oh, he didn't get knocked out. Let's give him a chance now. It's like games we played in, uh, uh, not quite that severe, but games we played in college. <laughs> we, would take a, we would take the towels and roll them up and, and, and the first one to flinch. Anyway, you don't want to know about all that stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but he was like, slap me in the face. I would say at least nine times out of ten, probably a whole lot more, they would be like, no, I'm not going to slap your face. I mean, even if you don't know the person, this is his neighbor. I don't know how much he knew him. I don't know if he's a good neighbor or a bad neighbor, but uh, slap him in the face is kind of weird. What's even weirder is what happened when he refused to slap him in the face. I forgot where I was. Verse uh, 12. Uh, 35, 35. Uh, yeah, now we're in 36. Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art de departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in the smiting he wounded him. I don't know if the guy saw the first guy or not, but it was like, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get this one right because I don't want to get eaten up by a lion. So when the prophet of God comes to him and says, hey, ask me for a sign, why would he do that? Like, what's the purpose of that? And what was the response of, uh, of Ahaz? <clears throat> well, Ahaz's response was, no, I'm not going to ask for a sign. He says... Uh, uh, let me see where the verse is. Or Isaiah, I'm way off here. Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, he says, go, uh, verse 11, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now again, it is something that 
they knew to be the rule in Bible. Remember, Jesus even quotes that when Satan tries to tempt him. He's like, hey, I'm, you're not supposed to tempt the Lord thy God. And so God's telling him to do it, and he's just like, I'm not going to tempt God. You would think then that Ahaz must be a pretty good guy. Like, he doesn't want to disobey God's rules. Here's the problem. He wasn't a good guy. And he disobeyed a lot of God's rules, and he was setting up idols and causing people to fall astray and all this stuff. So Isaiah, under the inspiration of God and speaking on, on the, as a mouthpiece for God, is actually rebuking him and cursing him and, and all this kind of stuff. And so at this time he says, you know, uh, ask for a sign. And he says, oh, I don't want to tempt the Lord. Uh, and then he gives them a sign. He, God says, okay, well, I'll give you a sign. So here's a few reasons why. Number one... You know, why did he ask him for a sign? Well, number one, so that it would be recorded, because this is prophecy, right? Because it is the prophecy about a future event. Okay, so sometimes weird things happen in the Bible, and you're like, I don't know why that happened. Why was Jonah three days in a whale's belly? That just seems weird, right? Why did God do that? And then it comes out in the New Testament, oh, because that represents Jesus being three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, in this case... The sign that God gives Ahaz is, well, let's read it. Verse, thir uh, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, this is a, a little confusing here, and I, I'm not going to say I know exactly what we're talking about, but I'm going to spe speculate a little bit. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and to choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. I'm on verse 17. The Lord shall bring up upon thee um, the Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss from the fly that is in the uttermost part of the river of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes and the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with the razor that is hired, namely uh, by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet. And it shall also consume the beard. And it shall come to pass in that day that the man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give. He shall eat butter for butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be uh, where they were a thousand vine, where there were a thousand vines at a thousand uh, sil silverlings. It shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. And on all hills that shall uh, be digged with the mattock, there shall come, not come thither the fear of briars and thorns. But it shall be for the shedding forth of the oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. So you get all that prophecy right there? Neither do I. <laughs> okay, I don't understand it. Uh, but... I'm going to give you a few thoughts on this. So this is prophetic about a future time. And the, re the reason that we know that is Matthew 1. Go to Matthew 1. First of all, what time in history has there ever been somebody who was born of a virgin? Okay, he said, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. Well, Matthew 1, verse 23, <clears throat> it says, uh, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken... Uh, spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And then jo Joseph woke up. And it doesn't say anything about butter and honey. It doesn't say anything about some of these other things that are hard for us to understand about the cows and the goats and, and all this stuff. But it does say a, a child shall come forth from a virgin, right? Child shall... Uh, I mean, a virgin shall conceive 
and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which the New Testament explains to us that Emmanuel means God with us. Okay, so Jesus was obviously God with us, and he was, you know, he was on earth to to you know for a mission sent by God, but he was God as well. And it says, uh, you know, he was Emmanuel, God with us. So what does that have to do with what was going on in Isaiah's day? That's a good question. I'll try to come back to it here in a minute. But, um, but we've already seen elsewhere so far where it seems quite clear that Isaiah is be, being given prophecies that concern the end times, like the end times of the world, not the end time, like his end times, uh, not 20 years from now or the next kingdom or something like that. But obviously these are, these are things that, are, that we could go to Revelation and look at, Revelations and look at. Uh, no, I was right the first time. Revelation. <laughs> we can, uh, you know, see Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and all this and say, like, man, this is exactly what Isaiah was talking about. So, you know, if you believe the New Testament, which I'm sure all of us in here do, then you have to say by, under, by believing the New Testament that these things written in the Old Testament are being fulfilled in, in, in these things. So, so one of the reasons that he tells them this, hey, I'm going to give you a sign, is because this is prophecy, and this is being recorded for future generations to read, and it's all talking about Jesus. Okay, Again, this, whole, this is key to all of this prophecy, any prophecy in the whole Bible. The key is that not so much, it's not so much important about who you are or what your nation's like or what your temple is like or anything like that. But it, it, what's important is the prophecies concerning Jesus. Even the prophecies to Abraham way back in Genesis, at the very beginning of this Jewish uh, um, nation, he's like, hey, your seed is going to, you're going to be a blessing to the whole world and your seed is going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to be a blessing to the whole world. And it's clearly talking about Jesus. And if you don't believe that, Galatians, again, yeah, if you believe the New Testament, it clearly says that the prophecies given to Abraham was about all the world that comes to faith through Jesus Christ. And so we're the seed of Abraham in that way. <clears throat> so this weird sign that out of the blue is just like, hey, ask for a sign. Okay, I'll give you a sign. And then, he, and then he tells them this thing, which is depicting Jesus. Just like when Jesus said, hey, I'll give you one sign. And then he talks about himself and his redemption uh, power that comes through his death, burial, resurrection. Okay, so the second reason to ask him to tell him, to, you know, ask me for a sign. It seems like a weird thing to say, but it's also humbling to the person who's being asked that. And here's why. It's kind of like saying, it's kind of like going to your child who you, you, maybe that's not a good enough example. Maybe it should be like, all right, let's say, let's say you're the boss of a company and your employee, you know, you kind of walk by and you heard him talking to uh, his, uh, his coworker and he's talking about you. He's saying like, you don't treat him well and all this kind of stuff, but he doesn't know you're listening to him. And so you, you wait a little bit, and like an hour later, you're like, hey, come into my office, so-and-so. And then they come into the office, and you're like, now, do you have something to say about me? You want to tell me what you, what you just said? You understand how, how humbling that is? Because you're just like, oh, no. <laughs> God knows something about me, and he's confronting me with that. Like, you got something to say? And so uh, it's, it, it's, it's similar to that, I think, where God is saying, Hey, ask me for a sign. Like, you don't believe? You're not following the right God? You're not doing all the things that I told you to do? Why don't you ask me to give you a sign that I am God, that I'm going to do these things and all, and all this stuff? And he's like, no, 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 no. I can't. Of course, he's talking to Isaiah, but he's, he's just a mouthpiece for the Lord. And he's like, no, 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 no. I can't ask God for a sign. I, I'm a, uh, yeah, I don't want to tempt him, right? I'd be like being in your boss's office and saying like, no, 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 I don't have anything bad to say about you. <laughs> and so, uh, so it's humbling that he asked that question. It's a reminder about who is in charge. And just his response that says like, no, 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 I don't want to tempt God. It's kind of telling about the attitude that he has. Even though he's the king of, Jer of, of uh, Judah, he's in this moment of like, whoa, no, I'm not going to tempt God uh, because he knows that he's been, he's been caught. And then uh, the final reason for this prophecy is something that I would suspect, okay, I can't say 
um, how this works out exactly. But as with pretty much all the prophecy in the Bible, there is something that was applicable to them in that day. So how the butter and the honey was actually like literally fulfilled, I don't know. You know, maybe they're going to go into Babylon, they're going to be destroyed and all these things. Like he talks about this destruction, but then he's like, those who are left in the land are going to eat butter and honey. It makes me kind of think of the promised land, right? The land of milk and honey. And, uh, and it's almost like, hey, though, that remnant, those people who are left after everything is destroyed, they're going to be eating butter and honey, which is kind of like symbolic for the promised land. Uh, that we are going to receive after, you know, because here's the thing, they never really received the promised land. <laughs> Abraham never saw it. The, uh, Mo, you know, Moses never saw it. There were kings who were setting up their empires in the promised land uh, after the time of the kings, but it was, it was just fallen and divided, and it was never, it certainly was never just this wonderful. Solomon had a moment where everything was looking pretty good, and there was peace in the land, and it was very uh, successful, and then he built the temple. But then you see all these things happening, wicked kings, and the nations divided, and there's all this kind of stuff. None of the fulfillments about the promised land and this wonderful time of milk and honey and all this stuff is going to happen until the millennial kingdom. And so I think that that's the way that we need to take the story and look at it, which, like I said, we've already seen where the rest of Isaiah so far has gone back and forth, but there's been a lot of talk about the coming, um, you know, resurrection and about the, uh, the, the millennial kingdom and about the wrath of God that's poured out before the millennial kingdom. Like, it's going back and forth, but all of that lines up so well with stuff that's yet to come that while we're reading it, we look ahead and say, oh, this is what he's talking about. And we know God does that because there was a virgin that conceived and had a son, and it was Jesus. So we know that when in Isaiah's day, he was talking about Jesus, which is way out in the future. So we know that God does that. Now, the question is, well, how did this prophecy relate to people in that day? So there's this kind of controversial thing that's out there that says uh, that that word... That is translated, you, I think you've probably heard me say this before when we went through uh, the kings. This word that's, that's uh, translated virgin in the Old Testament can also mean a maid. Like just a, maybe maid's not the right word, just like a, a young girl. Okay, Not necessarily a virgin, but just a young girl. So a lot of people, and this is what the Jews would say today, like that's not what it's talking about. You know, don't bring up this whole Jesus was born of a virgin. That's not what that word means. That word just means a young girl. Okay. But they can't deny when they say that, that it could also mean a virgin. And it does mean a virgin. And I'm sure the case could be made. I'm not a scholar in this, so I don't know. But I'm sure the case could be made from both sides what this word, what this word means. But my suspicion is, in that day, they weren't necessarily looking for somebody to, for some virgin to conceive. As far as I know, none of the kings claimed to be born of a virgin. And we know they weren't because Jesus was the only one. But there, was, there were some good kings that came after Ahaz, who I'm not going to take the time to read about it because I don't, I don't have the time. Hezekiah was one of them, a great king that tore down all the wickedness, tore down the idols, brought things back together to, uh, to a good time uh, for the people in, in, in uh, peace with the Lord. And so for the people in that time, as they're going through the Babylonian captivity and they've seen all the destruction in the back of their mind, they're thinking like, hey, you know, there's going to be somebody who's going to conceive and have a son. And, and uh, you know, who knows how this was, how this was fulfilled in their, their day. But here we are removed from that thousands of years later looking at, well, how does this apply to us? And I do believe there's an application to us because it's prophetic about things that have, have yet to come. And I think that the ultimate takeaway is that, you know, again, it's all about Jesus Christ, and He's born. He, he, he fulfilled all that stuff. So all the prophecies were about the coming Christ. And then from our perspective, it's like, okay, if you will be faithful, endure the destruction, and, endure, and just stay away from the corruption, stay away from the idols, and stay away from the, all that stuff. If you'll just live a godly life and be part of that remnant that endures unto the very end, right? 
you will have. Now I realize if someone dies they're, and, and they're saved, they're still going to go to heaven. But there will be some that, that endure to the very end. And if you endure to that time, here's what you have to look, to look forward to. The land of milk and honey, right? The promised land. And so I, 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 that's, that's what I can get out of that. Um, I have briefly looked over some different commentaries and they didn't agree. So I was like, well, you know. If I don't agree, then it's just we'll just throw another interpretation out there. But uh, but it's not up for private interpretation. We know that the things that I said are true. Those things are going to happen. But that's what I think that he's talking about in Isaiah 7. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this study and this great book of, uh, of Isaiah. So many wonderful things that are quoted in the New Testament and so many things for us to hold on to and to lean on for uh, uh, as far as prophecies for future time. Lord, we pray that you just help us live faithful and, and trust your word and believe your word and know that the things that you said are going to happen are, will come to pass eventually. If we just uh, be patient and uh, continue to do the work and continue to go forward, then we have nothing to worry about. So I pray that you help us know that and help us uh, live that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.